good evening, my dear colleagues. Today we are going to talk about a highlight in the domain of neurophilosophy, which is, of course, the relationship between consciousness and brain. And this topic was regarded, let's say, until 15 years ago to be uh, unsolvable, at least by natural science or by brain science. And the uh, reason for this attitude, that it appears to be enig absolute enigmatic or unsolvable scientifically, is that we usually obtain a dualistic concept of mind or of consciousness. In our own experience, consciousness or mind, and we will see what this means, um, according to this view, a daily life view, mind is something immaterial and ontologically different from the material external world. If you ask ourselves how we experience mind or consciousness, um, it immediately uh, is clear that consciousness is something that is different from any other thing in our world, from the seeds or from wood or any object we know. It has apparently no site, no location and space, but and even the temporal properties of consciousness or mind are strange. Sometimes time passes very quickly, sometimes it's very slow. And we, if we ask ourselves and, uh, and are being asked, it is similar to the physical world, we would immediately say no, something completely different. So the dualistic concept of mind is not only a highly traditional uh, view of mind and consciousness, but it's natural to us to treat consciousness and mind as being radically different from anything in our outer world and even from our body. So mind is immaterially and ontologically, as we say, different from the material external world. Apparently, it is not governed by natural laws. We cannot measure it, we cannot weigh it, and it makes no sense to apply any of the known natural laws to it. And from this follow that mind cannot be explained by natural sciences. This is what 15, 20 years ago most philosophers believed and almost anybody else. And even today, many things, many people would say yeah, this is something beyond natural sciences. However, since antique times and since the, the famous philosopher René Descartes, there was a problem. Because apparently, this mind, this consciousness, can influence our body, our bodily acts. And our body can influence our mind, for example, when we experience pain. So there is a relationship between mind, consciousness, on the one hand, and the body. But how could something influence, for example, the mind, if it were immaterial to influence without violating the physical laws of our body? This was a deep problem at the time of Descartes and was not solved until today. So either consciousness is something beyond the uh, realm of nature, then the interaction between soul or mind and body becomes a deep problem. Or mind is something natural, but then we have the problem that we do not experience it as such. This is a very deep problem. So we, at least, we um, end up with a phenomenal dualism. So we accept that mind appears to be something completely different, although it might be that this is an illusion. <coughs> I, we will treat it later. So the central question is, is there something like a mental causation so that our mind, our thoughts, our will, our free will can influence our brain or our body such that the body does what the mind wants to do. This is a deep problem.
this concept of the immaterial mind or soul is extremely old and almost all cultures in the world have this dualism. This is very natural on the one hand, as I explained, uh, on the basis of our daily experience. We experience mind as being something or thoughts as something completely different from the material world, but also when people die, it was believed in almost all religions and cultures of the world that a principle, mental principle or soul, leaves the body. And this soul was believed to be something like a vital force. Soul, in earlier philosophies, was the force that makes, or the power, that made the organisms alive. And when we die, then the soul leaves the body and goes to some special place. Interestingly, a similar situation happens when we are sleeping. And sleep and dreams um, impressed people from, for thousands of years, because during sleep we lie as if we were dead. But after waking up, we report that we had experienced many interesting things, strange things, that we were wandering around in the world while we were lying as being dead. And the interpretation of this state was only that there is a soul that during sleep leaves the body as happens after death is wandering around and upon waking up, it re-enters the body. This is a very ancient concept. So the existence of dreams was another support for this dualistic concept, very important one. And especially many religions had to deal with the problem that after dying, the soul had to be carried on by some uh, entities or angel here that the soul is being led to a secure place and not wandering around in the world. And the bad spirits are those souls that were not guided to a safe place. For example, those between uh, Christmas and the beginning of New Year, this was a gap in the year where the bad spirits had power. And so we had to make a lot of noise in order to <laughs> keep them away. This is all deeply, deeply symbolic. So the, this gap of the year is a gap where the, the, the bad spirits could enter time and space. Well, as Nora Neuroscientists or natural scientists, now we accept mind and consciousness are nothing but products of our brain. However, if we say this, then we have two deep problems. The first is, as a natural scientist, I can make experiments and there are arbitrary numbers of observers that could check whether or not we carried out the physical experiment. And if you tell me, oh, I don't believe it, I can show you. Come to my lab and i show you. I carried out the experiment this way. And you say, yes, it is. This is not possible for consciousness. Even if I say, oh, believe me, I have consciousness, or this animal has a consciousness. There's no direct way of proving it. Everything is belief. I believe, I assume, you have consciousness. And I might even, as a biologist, believe that apes or maybe even cows or horses have consciousness. But this is indirect. So consciousness is experienced directly only by those who have consciousness, by one person. And your consciousness is not accessible to me, but only to you. 
This is a deep problem. And philosophers were talking about the true deep problem in neurophilosophy, which is the unique, singular, individual access to my own, exper to my own experience of consciousness. The fundamental explanatory gap. I will come to this at the end of my talk. And then, of course, the matter of mind, the matter of consciousness. What is this? Present day physics said, does say nothing about the nature of consciousness. It seems truly to be beyond the realm of physics. Let us see how far we can come with brain science. This is a human brain, you may know it. This is the front, this is the back. And here we have the cerebral cortex. This is the nicely uh, wound surface. And it is clear now that only those processes that take place inside this cortex, at least in humans, are correlated or paralleled by consciousness. Everything else inside the brain, how complicated it is, is not accompanied by consciousness. And we will ask ourselves, is there a reason for this fact? This cortex contains about 15 billion neurons, 15 milliarden in German, and about 5 uh, times 10 to the 14 synapses. This is a lot of synapses. So its complexity is rather gigantic. And the question is, is hypercomplexity necessary for consciousness? But before we ask ourselves about the possible neurobiological basis of consciousness, let us ask as psychologists, what are the different states of consciousness? We immediately recognize that there is no such thing like the consciousness, but very different states of consciousness. This is very important. First, there is general awareness, also called vigilance, just to be aware, just to be awake, without perceiving or thinking anything which is possible. The most prominent state of consciousness certainly is awareness of external and internal events, perception, conscious perception. I see something, I hear something, I feel something, I have pain, and so on, and mostly combined with selective attention. So I turn my attention to something in the external world or in, inside my body when I have tooth pain. This is the most prominent form of consciousness. And I, the more I uh, attend something, the more detailed I can describe, usually, this event. So consciousness is strictly bound to reportability. <coughs> Whenever a certain person can report something in a detailed way, we are relatively safe to say he was conscious of this. Because if I'm not conscious of certain things, because I turn my attention to other things, I cannot report it. I'm asked, oh, did you see this car here on, on the highway? No, I haven't seen it. Then it makes no sense to ask him, oh, so describe it. What color did it have? So, no, I was not attending it, but it was in front of your eyes, but I had no attention to it, so I cannot report it. Reportability is something very important. This is uh, actual consciousness, general awareness, awareness of external and internal events, and selective attention. And then there is a background, there are background states of consciousness. For example, body identity awareness. 
the awareness, the consciousness that this is my body, where I am in. This is a strange feeling that I am something, I don't know who or what, but certainly it's in this body. And this seems absolutely natural to us. Unfortunately, there are patients who have certain disturbances and say, I'm not belonging to this body. Dear doctor, take me out. I'm not, or I'm outside the body. So we see that this background consciousness, the conviction, this is my body, is a construct, a very important construct. The same is true with uh, awareness of body and self in space and time. That I know I'm now at Jakob University here in Bremen and not in Hamburg or in Munich or elsewhere. But this is not trivial because there are patients who do not know where they are or they believe that they are in, at two places at the same time. And they don't find this strange. But for us, it's inconceivable to be at two places at the same time. Some, sometimes a uh, professor wishes to be at two places, <laughs> to give two lectures at the same time. But this wouldn't help because then your, your load would be even <laughs> doubled. Autobiographic identity awareness, the consciousness that I am the same uh, uh, who I was yesterday, which is not trivial at all. Sometimes people wake up and they don't know who they are. They cannot remember who they are. Very strange. And the same is awareness of authorship of own act and thoughts. There are patients who say, my hand is not moved by myself, but by alien forces. There's something who governs my thoughts, my feelings, and my, my movements. And at least to the movements, they need not be schizophrenic, but they just have certain brain damages. For example, disturbances with respect to the reafferents, the, the back pathways from my muscles to the brain. And as soon as I cut them or cool them down, Normal people will immediately say, this is not my arm, this is not my hand anymore. Because the brain, as we know by now, always controls whether it can control the movement. And if it controls the movement and sees it, but has no feeling of this control, it's not the arm anymore. This is alien hand syndrome, very strange. Reality checking whether or not I believe this is a dream or reality. And of course, self-awareness, self-recognition, self-reflection. So in essence, there is actual states of consciousness and they change in, in a pace of one second, as I will tell you in, in a second. This is the content of our actual awareness. And then there is background awareness. It continues there. It's me who is here at Jacobs, who is perceiving, who is moving his own body. I know where I am and who I am. I recognize myself in the mirror. All this seems absolutely trivial, but there are many poor patients who lack one or the other. And the most interesting thing is not only that there is actually a mosaic of many different states of consciousness, but one little piece of consciousness can drop out independent of the other. So people can wake up, they are as intelligent as yesterday, they perceive the world, they can control their body, they know where they are, but they cannot recognize themselves anymore in the mirror. Or they do not know who they are. Or they're absolutely normal, but they say, this is not my body. Or they say something different. Um, so this leads us to the concept that like many other things in perception and memory, consciousness 
consists of many different states and is modular. So there are mod different modules of consciousness and that they are distributed all over the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is the seat of consciousness and as we will see, many things in the brain contribute to consciousness, but only conscious perception is possible inside the cortex. So we see there is body awareness, body identity and perspective self in the so-called parietal cortex. There's visual and auditory awareness. And when there are lesions, this consciousness is gone. Then there is autobiographic awareness. This is located here where 38 is written on the uh, frontal region of the so-called temporal cortex. There's social, ethical, moral self, linguistic self. There's the action planning self and reasoning. This is up here. Self-attribution to actions resides here. And if there is a deficit or a lesion, then we do not, then we say, it's not me who is doing this. So we can today, from knowing those psychological deficits, immediately conclude that there are certain lesions in the brain. Absolutely for certain. This is fantastic, and this tells us a lot. What is special about the cortex? The cortex, as I told you, consists in the human brain of about 15 billion of these pyramidal cells. Most 80% of the cortical neurons are of this one type, pyramidal cells, and plenty are so-called interneurons, and we just forget them. Most which is unique because normally in other parts of the brain there's a mixture of many different kinds of neurons and the cortex is very unique to have one dominating kind of, of neurons. And these pyramidal neurons look like this here. This is a pyramidal cell. This is a pyramid-shaped cell body, and then the appendages, the dendrites, and the one axon or several axons. And these dendrites are covered with those spines. This is absolutely characteristic of the pyramidal neurons in the cortex. And these spines, dawnen, they are the seat of contacts from other neurons. Normally, inside the cortex, it's not the case that every neuron is connected to every other. This would be, if this were be the case, our brain would, be, would have a diameter of one kilometer. Fortunately enough, it's not fully connected, but it's connected, each neuron is connected to 30,000 other neurons, just as a rule of thumb. So one neuron is connected to 30,000, mostly in their immediate neighborhood. And they are the principle of connectivity in the cerebral cortex is very interesting because there were models of optimal connectivity in any hypercomplex system. And you can mathematically show that the optimal connectivity follows the principle of dense local and sparse global connectivity. This is a fundamental principle, and it was absolutely shocking that inside our hypercomplex brain, exactly this principle, which was derived from completely different uh, domains of science, is realized in our cortex. This is wonderful. Because Full connectivity, which would make our brain absolutely gigantically large, is not even highly effective. And this uh, full connectivity in the immediate neighborhood of one neuron and sparse connectivity over large difference is called the small world connectivity. You may have heard about this because there is a model saying over four to five steps, everybody in this world is related to everybody else. About four steps. 
And if you ask me about the human cortex, I can tell you over four taps, every neuron in the, uh, in the cortex of humans is connected to everything, but not directly, but over four steps. This is the most economic and reasonable concept. So it's fascinating and even astonishing that the machine that produces thoughts and, and other things follows absolutely fantastic abstract principles that engineers have calculated long before neuroanatomists discovered it. So these are the spine synapses and about 30,000, maybe 25,000, this differs, have direct contact with one pyramidal cell. Each of these spine synapses is, as shown here, is a absolutely astonishing mechanisms for transmission of neuronal activity. The principle, which is very important, is that in one end, for example here, one axon, as called, comes, ends here, and it contact, this is a presynapse, and this is a postsynapse, like maybe more, or two or three. Let's say this here is a presynapse, and this is a postsynapse, and this here is a presynapse, and this is a postsynapse. The electric activity comes here, is then transformed into chemical activity, chemical substances, transmitters, are released and they induce, again, electric activity in the postsynapse. So all over, at every, almost every synapse, there is a coding of electric in, uh, information to chemical information and back to electric information. And the rule is electric information is for fast, simple, processing and uh, conduction of impulses when there are long distances, whereas chemical transmission is complex or hypercomplex. And this chemical transmission is extremely complex. So one out of these 500 <coughs> trillion synapses is a miracle of complexity, every synapse. And this has to be understood. It's not just the number of synapses, but the fact that every of these 500 trillion synapses is a miracle of, it's a computer, let's say, of its own. We have 500 trillion little computers only in our cerebral cortex. Now, Consciousness is not related to a brief and very fast transmission in enormous synapse. This is in the framework of two milliseconds and is completely unconscious. So this fast transmission and fast information processing inside the brain is completely unconscious. What is conscious? is only if there is plasticity, if the type of transmission, the strength of transmission or the kind of transmission is being changed. This may be accompanied by consciousness, not the very fast transmission in the realm of milliseconds. So consciousness as I've written here, is bound to fast rewiring of large cortical semantic networks, of networks that are uh, related to the meaning of things. So consciousness always have to do with the processing of meaningful content. And it's fast, but not in the range of milliseconds, but in the range of seconds. More exactly, from 0.3 to 3 seconds. 
And this has been known very long to be the pace of the stream of consciousness. More than 100 years ago, highly intelligent psychologists told us the pace of, of consciousness is about one second. The shortest thought we can have lasts about one second. And no, not much longer, three seconds, four seconds, then one thought is gone. And there was no explanation why consciousness is not much faster or much slower. Could be. Why is it one second? And the answer is easy and complex at the same time. This neuromodulation, this change of plasticity, of the strength of coupling between pre-synapse and post-synapse, lasts between 0.3 seconds and 3 seconds. Because it's chemical and chemistry, all these highly complex things take this time, which is sometimes a thousand times longer as a fasted transmission possible in the brain, which is unconscious. So here we have a strict insight that consciousness in its temporal property is strictly bound to the rewiring or plasticity at the synaptic side in the cerebral cortex, which is highly astonishing. But you will get in a moment why this is the case. And uh, this rewiring is very expensive. A very short transmission, unconscious transmission, is inexpensive. It takes one millisecond or two one millisecond, costs nothing. But rewiring this so-called synaptic plus, uh, coupling is expensive be because there are a lot of changes, so-called uh, receptor, second messenger cascades, and going to the uh, uh, genome and so on, and all this extremely expensive. And if consciousness is bound to the cortical rewiring, to cortical plasticity in the realm of one second, it follows that consciousness must be extremely expensive metabolically. This follows directly. And we will test whether this is the case. And here we see something interesting. We said before consciousness is something completely immaterial. And we think, and we think, it costs nothing. The thought is nothing. But if you look at the brain, while a person is thinking, the brain has enormous metabolic increase in oxygen and sugar consumption. But we are not aware of it. But we are shocked, and we, you know when there is not enough uh, oxygen in, in, uh, in a room, or if, we ha ha if you have low sugar level in your blood, then you cannot think anymore. Then you fade. But you don't know why. But the brain does. So this is extremely important. Consciousness is metabolically highly expensive due to high oxygen and glucose consumption. And this is not the so-called spike, which costs almost nothing. It is a rewiring because it's chemical. And these are highly complex chemical molecules. And they are expensive. And just to tell you how expensive is the brain occupies about 2% of our body volume. And even in the resting state, it consumes 20% of our metabolism. And if we think and are highly conscious, attentive, this goes strongly up to 30-40%. And highly thinking blocks any, every other activity. If we are extremely attentive, then we can do nothing else. Because then the brain needs all the available oxygen and sugar. So mind is extremely expensive, metabolically. Although we are not aware of it, only after 
listening highly attentive to somebody, after five minutes or 10 minutes, you are just ruined. You just, stop, please stop. I, I'm running out of energy. It's a direct correlation. So asking ourselves, why is the cerebral cortex, at least in humans, the seat of consciousness? We have here, we here have a long list. Why this is, there's high synaptic connectivity, 15 billion neurons and 500 trillion synaptic contacts. Super gigantic network. Although it's a question, is it necessary that this is so complex? And the answer is no. There are animals that have much smaller brains, and we have good reason to think they are conscious. There, are, there is, and this is a very important topic, high self-referentiality inside the cortex. The cortex speaks to itself 100,000 times more than to the outside world. The ratio between intracortical connections and connections from the cortex to the outside world sensory, with sensory pathways or motor pathways is 100,000 to 1. So the cortex is almost only talking to itself. And this is self-referentiality and philosophically this is of great importance. There is this modification of strength of synaptic coupling around one second. This is a stream of consciousness in the page of one second, as I mentioned before. There are large and detailed primary sensory motor areas, there are multimodal integration areas. The cortex is the seat of declarative memory. The, this memory we can report. And there is a formation of secondary representation of thoughts and imaginations beyond primary sensory areas and their strong interaction with the limbic system, which means emotions and motives govern the work of our cortex. So um, this is interesting because if we take all this point in the list, we could ask, is the human cortex the only network that could produce consciousness? And the answer is no. Birds have a completely different part in their brain. They're highly intelligent. They certainly have consciousness but their brain is constructed in a very different way. So these are rather abstract principles. How they are realized anatomically is something very different. Maybe we can talk about uh, this uh, later. Now let's ask, why do we have consciousness at all? This is a very good question because 90% of what we are doing in our daily life is either completely unconscious or only accompanied by consciousness. While I'm walking in front of you, while I'm moving my arms, while I'm moving my lips, while I'm standing upright and many other things, I do this without any knowledge how my brain is doing these functions. I have no idea and nobody in the world really knows how this is done. Also, seeing and hearing, no idea how this is done by my brain. And the most fantastic things, for example, guided, driving a car through city of Bremen while listening to a nice music and talking to a nice person uh, sitting next to me, I can do the most complicated things without any attention. So, 90, 95, 99% of the most important and most complicated things, driving a car, is rather complex. We do without consciousness. So complexity and consciousness are not strictly related, which is astonishing. We would think simple things are, are, can be done without consciousness, and complex things need consciousness, but the opposite is the case. For example, look, look at a, a pianist, piano player. He plays the most complicated pieces and concertos and he hammers on the piano and he is only aware that he is playing. 
but not how his finger are hitting the, 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 the right key. He has no knowledge about this. And it may be a piano player giving a Beethoven or Liszt concerto is one of the most complex things a human being could do at this velocity. There's no time for reflecting or thinking about. This is done intuitively, and we know that the cerebral cortex is not necessary. It's so-called basal ganglia that do this. Riding a car, riding a bicycle, skating, all this is done without reflection. But why then do we need consciousness especially if consciousness is so expensive? This is a good question. Now let us, as psychologists, ask ourselves where and why do we need consciousness? Detailed perception is absolutely impossible without conscious attention. We can perceive unconsciously, of course, but this is slow and without any details. If we are going to have detailed perception, we need consciousness. And if things are tiny and, and we have to look very hard. Uh, for example, reporting what I've said before. If I ask you, what did I say just a second ago? You must have had consciousness, conscious experience of what I said, otherwise you cannot report it. If you were dreaming of something else, you, you're unable to report it. I could emotionally maybe influence you, but not you could not report what I said. Processing of large multimodal data sets. Unconscious experience is largely unimodal. If there's multimodal experience, we need consciousness. If we hear and see something at the same time and touch, we need consciousness. Semantically deep information processing, including language. You could have a very superficial awareness what's going on when a certain person is talking some, about something. But if you really want to understand what he or she is saying, listening to a teacher or to a professor, you need conscious awareness. Otherwise, impossible. Therefore, the teacher or the professor, please keep silent and listen to me. Otherwise, you will not understand what I was going to say. Absolutely directly. Internal control of attention. If I decide now to look at this object or that object, to listen at this voice or that voice, there's so-called internal guidance of attention. This is conscious. It's impossible. There's unconscious control of attention if there's something loud or a, a, a flash or something. This is bottom-up control of attention, but not top-down. Top-down is the interest I have in something, and this must always be conscious. Fast comprehension of behaviorally relevant events. My unconscious perception may happen, but it's slow. If I want to know exactly what's going on, I have to concentrate. And within one, fracture, one second, I can identify a certain danger. Unconsciously, I can uh, recognize only, oh, there is something bad happening, but not exactly what. So there, there is a famous colleague of mine who said, well, we will see something and run away because our, my amygdala is telling me there's something danger. But just running away, then I realize it was not a rattlesnake, it was just something else. This is detailed perception. Medium and long range action planning. I can do something in immediate range, many complex things, but I cannot unconsciously plan what I'm going to do tonight or tomorrow. Action planning is one of the prominent features of humans. Most animals are very poor at this. And action planning, what I'm going to do tomorrow or within one week, 
absolutely requires consciousness. And of course, thoughts, imaginations, self-consciousness, this is function of consciousness. So there is something behind, we will see, uh, that means whenever we need detailed processing of information, then we can do this only with consciousness. And consciousness, therefore, has a major function that whenever there is something that is both new and important to the brain, new and important, then tense consciousness is turned on. If it's important but not new, then we do it with other basal ganglia like driving a car. Uh, if it's new but not important, then our brain does not process it anymore. Only if it's new and important. And now the question is who or what in our brain is identifying something as important so that it's sent to consciousness. So when we ask ourselves which parts of the brain are active when we have consciousness, we have a number of very different parts of the, our brain which themselves are not conscious but contribute to the origin of consciousness. So consciousness arises in our cortex but there are many parts of the, of the brain that contribute to this rise. It's not the cortex itself only that produces consciousness. Let us say see where this is. And here we have, again, the medius uh, view of the cerebral cortex, where there is consciousness. But this blue part here is mostly unconscious. For example, this part here, the so-called singular gyrus, is that part that controls attention. There are unconscious impulses that influence this singular gyrus. And then this part turns our consciousness, our attention, and this is situated here in the dorsal part of the frontal brain. This here, especially, this is a hippocampus. And we will see in a second what this hippocampus is doing, because it is the gate to memory. This is the novelty detector, one of the important novelty detector. And then there are other parts, tiny parts, the locus ceruleus or the raphe nuclei, tiny, tiny parts in the brain, maybe 100,000 neurons here, that are absolutely essential for the formation of consciousness, as I will tell you in a second. Let's look at the hippocampus. The hippocampus is part of the cortex, but an ancient one. Here, this is the this two to five millimeters deeply embedded here, and there's a hippocampus. And the hippocampus is not accompanied by consciousness, but it contributes essentially to the rise of consciousness because whenever we experience something unconsciously, it's before becoming conscious, it's compared to the content of our declarative memory. Declarative memory is a memory we can remember. There is a procedural memory in the so-called basic ganglia where we can do something even without knowing how we do it. We just do it without knowing. Many think that they're highly automatized. We can do them without knowing. We just forgot them. But the declarative memory, all the memory in the academic sense of knowledge is distributed over the entire cortex, which are, is here upside down. And this part, the uh, hippocampal formation, uh, senses something and then decides whether or not is new or old and together with other parts of the, of the uh, brain, important or unimportant. And whenever it's new and important, it sends 
This information, two relevant parts of the brain, of the cortex, where in our memory information resides that is relevant for the processing of this information. Because we need to know, as I said in my last lecture, our memory is the most important sense organ. Everything that is consciously perceived is a product of unconscious perception and the combination of this unconscious perception with the uh, memory in my perceptive, uh, of information in my perceptive memory. So we always see the world as we have learned to see it. And this is absolutely automatic. And the pictures we see when we enter a room mostly do not come from the outside, but only very few key stimuli come from the outside, and the 90, 95, or even more come from our memory. Because the brain recognizes, I know this, and immediately it flashes from memory uh, previous experience. And this is done by this uh, hippocampal formation. There is another part, the amygdala, and the amygdala is a center for inert emotions, emotional conditioning, and recognition of emotional communicative signals, for example, faces and gestures and body positions. So even here, the, the hippocampus evaluates it is new and important before it comes to consciousness. And the amygdala immediately evaluates if it's good or bad, together with other parts, not only the amygdala, immediately. And then we see something and we have a certain feeling, oh, this is nice, interesting, or this is bad, or this is dangerous, and so. So everything is first evaluated unconsciously and sent to the hippocampus for activation of the memory and to for, to the amygdala and other parts of the limbic system for evaluation. And then our perception comes up mostly combined with certain emotions. I see face and immediately I'm happy because this is a good friend of mine or this is interesting. Now, who or what is driving all these activities? These are the so-called neuromodulatory systems. There is one system for noradrenaline, one for dopamine, for one for serotonin, and one for acetylcholine. These neuromodulatory substances are always uh, produced in tiny islands inside our brain here, as I already showed you few hundred thousand cells are producing the substances, but these substances are then spread over the entire cortex, entire brain. What are these doing? The noradrenergic system or the noradrenaline or noepiphrenine, they produce general activation and rather the unspecific tension. By release of noradrenaline, we are awake and we are in a unspecific attentive state. Then serotonin is being released and this has a calming down effect. We feel satisfaction, comfortable, and this is involved in impulse inhibition. So this is very important. If we see something that is possibly frightening, then serotonin tells us do not respond immediately, but just calm down. The opposite is dopamine. This is energizing, rewarding, and reward promising. I will not go into the details. So these are antagonistic. Dopamine is driving us, and serotonin is coming down. And finally, acetylcholine produces focused attention and control of learning and memory. And this mix, the incredibly complex mix, is now uh, governing what a single neuron in the cerebral cortex is doing. 
there is sensory input coming to our brain, to our cortex, which is unconscious and tells the cortex what happened where. This ha has absolutely no meaning before. But then comes the memory system. It is a telling of the hippocampus. Is this new or familiar? And is this new, then it need to be important, wichtig. This is the evaluation system. And only if a certain sensory input is new and important, then this neuron and all the synapses undergo changes and a new network is being formed. So I see something, my brain states this is new, and at the same time, because the amygdala and other parts, emotional parts are saying this is important, then the brain tells itself, please rewire yourself and keep this in mind because it's important. I see a new face, I make a new experience, I learn something, and so on, I have a new thought, and this has to be kept in mind. And keeping in mind means as a new network being rewired, and then this is part of a new memory. This is consciousness, in essence. And this requires a lot of energy. Now, how could we demonstrate that this really is a case? This could, could all be fantastic philosophical and psychological ideas. We already know since 20 or 30 years that inside our cortex there are waves called electroencephalogram. If you put many electrodes, not just one, today 132 or even 264, just many, many electrodes, we can record these EEGs, which first hand mean nothing. But if we process this information, then we see whenever we see something relatively simple, or a word, we hear a word, or we see a face or so, then we can um, filter out a certain sequence of waves which is uh, here inside this rather chaotic movement. But they are defined waves and they indicate what happens within one second whenever our brain is confronted with a word or a little piece of music or a phase, something relatively simple. And here is the start of the stimulus. For example, some simple noise or a tone. In the first 10 milliseconds, these are milliseconds, this is analyzed in the so-called brain state, deep inside our brain. Let's go back. Uh, again. Uh, yeah, it starts here. This is a brainstem, and here are the very primitive things of what happens in sensory perception is being um, analyzed for 10 milliseconds. Then it's further analyzed whether it's important for 90 more seconds, a milliseconds. We now arrive at one tenth of a second, 100, milli, uh, yeah, 100 milliseconds. First, this is the nature of the stimulus, completely unconscious. Then the stimulus from 10 milliseconds on for 90 milliseconds is being evaluated. It is new. And then here we have a wave which is smaller when it's uninteresting and larger when it's more interesting. And the brain says, oh, I should process this stimulus. This is so-called N1 or N100 because it uh, occurs after 100 milliseconds. And 
just after 10 milli, uh, 100 milliseconds, if we look very fast to this EG, we could say this brain will later find this interesting. Before we, the, the, the person even knows that the brain is doing this. And then it takes 200 more milliseconds until 300 milliseconds, then there is a P300. And this curve, it's positive, occurs only when the brain decided this is important. And exactly after having stated that this is important completely unconsciously, this is a moment of consciousness. So first, the brain sees, it, is this interesting? And then, is this important? This takes 300 milliseconds, and then things become consciousness, because all processing mechanisms are turned on, the send to the cortex. Then we have the, the sensory feeling of seeing something consciously. So already 20 years ago, we knew that there's a huge processing of information before things become conscious, but we are absolutely unconscious of these elaborate mechanisms. Because we have the experience that we immediately perceive things. Things seem to be directly in front of us, and we hear music or sounds immediately. And here it's almost one-third of a second, and one-third of a second we could perceive, but it doesn't exist. The brain ignores this 300 milliseconds necessary for the um, processing of this unconscious information. Now, this is old and we could do much more refined things. For example, we could apply magnetoencephalography, MEG, or magnetic resonance imaging. Why are we applying two different kinds, which are equally expensive? Which is good, because then when you have these machines, you are famous and have a lot of money and people are envious. Uh, magnetoencephaly is like EEG. Uh, much more expensive, which is good, but it has a high temper resolution. It can measure events around one millisecond, like EEG. So it's extremely fast. But the, temp the, the spatial resolution is very poor. You cannot really say it happens here at a millimeter or there. This is bad. Magnetic resonance imaging is very good at spatial resolution, but very poor at temporal resolution. Spatial is about one millimeter. Temporal is one second, not one millisecond, so a thousand times less. But the temporal resolution may be 100 times better than EEG. And so we, uh, my colleagues and I, we use both things. I will uh, skip this. Now, first, I will show you the difference between unconscious and conscious perception. Here, we are lying in a functional MRI, and uh, we are shown uh, here a revolver or a rolling pin. And we, uh, this seems to be not dangerous and seems to be dangerous. And we have the task, either we have to look at both in a relaxed way, or we have to concentrate on both weapons, so to speak. And then, by functional MRI, uh, people look at our brain, and this is the amygdala, and then here we see something important. Here the pictures start, and after four to five seconds, there's activity in this tiny part of the brain, and this activity goes on. When we neutrally maintain the stimuli, when we do not really remember it, but when we remember it consciously, then the activity is about two times as high as if we just um, perceived it 
without special attention. So attention, we can show here, we can see here, drives the activity of the brain up. And this means we concentrate on certain things. So this revolver now appears to be absolutely dangerous. This is one important function of consciousness, to exaggerate, to emphasize our uh, perception so it's kept better in our memory. Now, highly impressive experiment. There's a person who has to fixate this point here and at the same time, in this right visual field, there's something colorful moving. So here, this rod here is moving back and forth, and for example, is right here. And this man has a task to figure out why it stares at the middle point, to see with his mental eyes what's going on in the right visual field. This is difficult, but this is possible. What would we expect to go on in his brain. We have to know all what's going on in the right visual field is processed in the left part of the brain. It's just crossing. And we know in this hind part of the brain there is movement and color uh, processed. And if we look at the brain, this is an artificial brain, and here is we're looking from slightly behind Here's the cerebellum, and this is the front. So the front is now here, and we're looking from behind onto this segmented brain. So this is the left side, while something uh, in, the, in the right uh, visual field is moving, there's activity in the left side of the brain. And this is a strict proof that this man was observing with attention this event. Otherwise, there would no, be no activity. This is false color but we can prove whether he was attentive to this stimulus. Now, this seems to be highly complicated, but it's not. This is the retina of the eye, and we know that inside the retina, two different things are processed differently. One is in this magno pathway, it is movement and space. And there is another pathway, the so-called P or Pavo pathway, which is color and form. And as we know, in the primary visual cortex, these two things are processed differently. All brains of all animals have this difference that color and form have to be processed differently from movement and space. There's no visual system that can process this is a fundamental physiological reason. But now this very simple analysis of the picture we see, or a monkey, this is a monkey brain, contrast, orientation, direction, movement, disparity, and so it then sent to higher brain areas until we see not simple things, but objects, scenes, meaning, and memory, or complex motion patterns and location, space, maps, and symbols. This is here in this part of the So at the very beginning, everything is highly detailed without any meaning. Then this detailed information is sent inside the brain and finally gets meaning here. So the, all these uh, uh, simple things are composed to become objects, scenes, memory, or location, space, maps, and symbols. So this is so-called distributed uh, processing. Now it was believed that first simple information is composed into complex and as soon as it arrived here then things become conscious. They get meaning. However, this is not the case. People made very refined experiments and for example friends of mine and they found the following thing, which seems to be complicated. Look here, there's one spot, yellow spot, then there will here be one other yellow spot, and immediately this first yellow spot appears. Let's go back. What we see here is a visual system of the brain just expanded, just made flat. 
This is the primary visual cortex where detailed information is the place, and this is V4 where meaning is the case. And now let's go back. It goes from here to here. Now we start here, there is activity in the primary visual cortex details, then this goes up here to the complex visual cortex, meaning, and then immediately back there is activity again in the first part. This is strange. Why not just from here to here? I again go back and again. It should go from here to here and then stop and things become conscious. But this is not the case. It goes back from here immediately back to the uh, primary visual cortex. And this was one of the, excuse me, one of the most important experiments for, during the last 10 years. Because this means we unconsciously perceive things in detail without meaning. Then this unconscious detailed perception is sent to those centers where meaning is produced. But these meaning centers cannot recognize details. They can recognize only meaning. For example, that this is a seat. They can say, tell you this is a seat, but not how the seat is looking like. The color, the edges, and the contrast. And we are perceiving both. When we are looking at a face, we see this is a face, I mean, for example, of John, but we also can tell details of the face, the color of the eyes, of the hair, and so on. But both centers cannot do this at the same time. You either produce meaning, this is a face of Oliver, but not how it looks like. This is stored in the, in the primary visual system, where the details are stored unconsciously. And the real is that details, unconscious, are sent to the meaning centers and they send their meaning back to the unconscious parts. And both together, meaning plus detailed, this is the moment when things become conscious. And this is very interesting because we have patience. When you ask them, what is this object they say, it's a seed. Well, please describe it to me, and they're unable to describe it. And there are patients who are asked, what is this object? They have no idea what this object is, but please make a drawing. They can draw it, but don't know wh what this is. And then you can predict what part of the system is being lesioned. It's either the detailed processing or the meaning processing. So this is called, the, the first is called agnosia, visual agnosia. People can recognize the form and color, but not the meaning. They are agnostic. And uh, to make uh, this very short, we can show certain targets, certain pictures unconsciously uh, we can mask them uh, by showing this only for 40 milliseconds and then it's followed by stimuli. But still, we could, from the first visual cortex, tell that the brain sees this without consciousness. However, our discrimination accuracy goes strongly up if we are conscious of this. So consciousness gives details and even accuracy of estimates. This is important part of the concept. Now, very briefly, I'm almost at the end. How far can we, with this method, read thoughts or, or perceptions? You may know that there are stimuli that are bistable. For example, the Necker cube or this vase and the profile, 
So if you look at them, they change the meaning. So the Necker cube, for example, goes back and forth in depth, or sometimes you see the old woman or the young woman or many of those nice pictures. And they alternate within maybe 10 seconds. And a former colleague of mine, John Haynes, looked at the brain while a person had these bistable experiences. And he could show here that there is a conscious perception or behavior report, one uh, stable um, percept, the other one, the other, you see here, almost 20, 20 seconds. And just by looking at brain activity, I will not go into details, he could predict in the next moment this person will press a button indicating I now see the other view. Just looking at the visual cortex of this person, it was possible using highly sophisticated uh, computing to read this out before the person said, now I see something in this way or the other way, red or green or, or uh, horizontal or vertical, he could predict. Now he will tell the following. So mind reading is possible even in a much more fantastic way, as I can tell you. And finally, this is work in my own institute, the question, how deep can we go down understanding what goes on during conscious state? Assuming that a monkey has consciousness, when, for example, the monkey has to follow with attention only the left part of these frames and press a button whenever a certain complex stimulus reappears. So there are stimuli, two stimuli, and he has to concentrate or he has to concentrate on the right one. And press a button only if after a certain sequence this exactly this reappears. So this animal has to concentrate and it takes half a year to teach him what to do. He gets rewarded by, uh, by apple juice or <laughs> And at the same time, this region of the visual system is being recorded. While this monkey is absolutely attentive to recognize, oh, this stimulus now returned after a certain time. What's going on in, this, in the brain? Hmm? What we see here in a certain region, this is highly abstract, in a certain region where the stimulus is represented where it tends, there is a synchronization of the related neurons at a band between 50 hertz and 90 hertz or 100 hertz, which means these neurons talk to each other at a frequency of almost 100 hertz they synchronize each other. Whenever we move our arm, motor neurons, let's say one million motor neurons have to synchronize, otherwise we could not move our arm. The same way, when this monkey or we attend a certain stimuli, then about one million neurons have to synchronize and they focus, so to speak, on what's going on on the screen where the monkey is looking for. Whereas the non-attended stimuli does not synchronize in this way. When the monkey concentrates on this area, then we have this synchronization of these neurons here. They all talk to each other at, at, uh, at 100 times per second, whereas the unattended part, there is nothing here. Now we tell the monkey, just switch your attention to this part, and what we see is now these neurons are synchronizing each other, but not the other one. So turning the attention to a new stimulus, we experience as 
detailed perception at the same time at the cellular level, the neurons related synchronize each other and this is a sign that they really are directly connected to attention. So we know that conscious attention is not met only metabolic expensive, it takes place in the cortex. But one important basis for conscious attention is synchronization of neurons. And this takes place, they synchronize within one second, they couple each other in the way I, I told you, and then they fire for a certain time, let's say three or four or five seconds, and the animal or humans are attentive to this. So, I'm coming to my first summary. Consciousness is necessarily bound to the activity in the cerebral cortex, first, at least in humans. It arises whenever parts of the brainstem pre-activate the cortex and say, this is important, then we have general awareness and sensory and limbic information have activated a sufficient number of cortical neurons, let's say one million, and then oscillatory synchronization comes up and we uh, send this as focused attention. Because the brain has decided this is new and important and now we have to concentrate, we, the neurons, have to concentrate on the stimulus. And this is bound to an increase in oxygen and glucose consumption and increased turnover of neurotransmitters, neuropeptides. So it's directly bound to chemistry. And if we remove this chemistry, we have no consciousness. It's absolutely directly from the global level to the cellular level to the molecular level. Summary two is now, consciousness as sensory awareness and attention is a special state of information processing which occurs whenever the brain is confronted with new, complex and important situations or problems in perception, understanding, problem solving, motor demands, communication, action planning. So consciousness is a special state of information processing inside the cortex. And interestingly, at first glance, we are very attentive. We are highly conscious when something new and important comes up. But whenever this is repeated, when we see it again, the sound is coming out, the face is the same. We are less and less attentive to it. And if we study the cortex, we see that the activity from the cortex fades in going down to the basal ganglia. And finally, we see it and have absolutely no attention anymore because it's not new anymore. It's uninteresting. You might listen to a fascinating talk first time, then next evening you, you hear the talk again. It's not so fascinating anymore. After the third evening, you're just bored. And after 10 times hearing the same talk, you just cannot listen to it anymore with attention, provided there's nothing new in it. So you get bored, and at the same time, it fades from the cortex, from attention into the basal ganglia, and then you finally, you can, you could give the talk <laughs> after a hundred times. It's like a routine. And this exactly when it fades out of cortex and out of attention. Then you don't have this, this uh, process anymore. And finally, it shows you even if or when we experience consciousness and mind as being immaterial, it is strictly bound to material, physical and physiological processes, absolutely necessary. This can be shown immediately if you block those physiological processes, for example, uh, if you go and give you narcotic drugs, it's gone. And those narcotic drug anesthesia works exactly at the molecular level I have told you. 
So this is the paradox. Although consciousness and thoughts are experienced by us to be completely immaterial, if you study them, they are strictly bound to physical, chemical, physiological basis. And if you manipulate this basis, then consciousness disappears. So we can say truly, consciousness is a special state of information processing of the brain. And without the brain, there is no consciousness, without the cortex, and without all those transmitters and synchronization of neurons, there is no consciousness, but we do not experience it. And the final question is, how come that we have this special awareness of consciousness? And one explanation might be that this state is a construct of a system that talks mostly to itself. A system that 100,000 times more intensely talks to itself is almost immune against influences from the outside and certainly can be accessed or understood only by itself. So the inaccessibility of consciousness from the outside I, uh, it's only me who knows that I'm conscious, is easily understood if you understand this ratio between intracortical connections and connection from the outside and to the outside. Such a system talks mostly to itself. So maybe even the strange nature of mind results from the specialty of this system residing in our cortex. Thank you very much. <laughs>